Next up, I'd like to welcome uh, our, our moderator for the section, Dr. Hans Lombardo. We're loaded with doctors at this event today. Dr. Hans Lombardo, he is a CMO and a director at BlockPass IDN out of Vietnam. And like that is like the great untapped uh, source of blockchain programmers. This is what I keep hearing from people that are there. Um, I've known Hans, I believe, probably 96, 97. We rode in and out of the dot-com boom together. I know we look like we're in our mid-20s, but we're a little bit older than that. Um, and he's still got the passion. He's still got the drive. Um, he's founded his own company. He's been a leading light in, in, in technology in this part of the world as long as I've known him, and as you just heard, that's for some time. So, moderator, here he comes, Dr. Hans Lombardo. Hans, come, take your chair. Here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, make a little bit of noise for our boy Hans. There we go. Good to see you, man. All right. Take a seat. Okay, so we're going to bring up the rest of the stage, but first up is going to be the man who's going to kick off the introduction, David Allen Cohen. He is the founder of Decentral. Uh, it's missing a few letters that you would expect, but it's very cool. You can see it right there. It is a cybersecurity blockchain company, but he has been in this for a long time. He was one of the, one of the, one of the early, uh, maybe in startup founding members of the IOTA Foundation, okay, for all the, you know, this is a blockchain crew. I don't have to explain IOTA to you. You guys know what it's all about. He's an advisor right now to Hedera Hashgraph, all this on top of running his own company. He's going to sit down, but then he's going to stand up and give us a little 10 minute intro to the panel. Here he comes, David Allen Cohen. David, come on up. The man from Decentral. All right. We got two more coming up here. Daughter, Dr. Marta Piekowska. She is the director of ecosystems for uh, Hyperledger. Oh, she's coming right up. Not even going to wait. Come, have a seat. Sit there, sit there. Oh, it's your choice. I'm going to slide over here so I'm not standing in front of you. Director of ecosystems for Hyperledger. Uh, within, of course, the Linux Foundation. You heard Julian Gordon this morning. He's based here. He's running Asia. But this is the director of ecosystems for Europe. So she's got a huge job. Again, another doctor. This is like a techie techie, you know, uh, with a great pedigree from uh, the best Polish and German universities. Is that right? Yes. So like a real scientist scientist. And we're very happy to have her today. And we got one more we're going to bring up here. Where'd he go? He's Francis Wong. Francis from Bucket Technologies. And right now living in Arkansas. Is that right? So he's all the way out of America. They've got a really interesting technology where they are going to get rid of change. You know, people say we're going to get rid of money. Well, first you've got to get rid of coins. This guy's going to do it through Bucket Technologies. But don't worry, the coins go away, but you still got the money in your pocket because of blockchain. There it is. All right. So Hans, you're in charge, but okay. David, you're going to launch into a little bit of a talk. Do you want to do it standing or sitting? Sure, it's standing. Standing. Okay. I will come over here and you can, you can own this space for 10 <laughs> minutes while you kick us off. Does that right. sound, sound like a plan? Yeah. That's a plan. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm turning it over. I think we have a presentation queued up here. All right, let's hit the button for him. Okay, I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about what I know. There's a lot of experts here on the panel, actually, that know a lot about interoperability, and I want to give you some perspective. Some of, the, some of it's true, some of it's actually made up. But um, there's a place in Utah it's called the Tower of Babel, and um, Andrew was talking about the Tower of Babel, about this communication. So this is um, what was written on that, the first actual block of the blockchain. In 2008, in the Tower of the Blockchain Babel account, in Block Genesis 1.1, it is said that every blockchain on Earth spoke the same language, but this is inconsistent with the biblical description of the post-Bitcoinic world described in Genesis 1.2 where it is said that the descendants of Bitcoin, Ethereum, and hundreds of other coins gave rise to different nations, each with their own language. This is the problem. We got hundreds of altcoins, hundreds of coins. The interoperability issue is actually very premature, but it's a discussion that everybody wants to talk about. And I have to give some perspective on what I've been doing for the past 30 years, which is in the smart grid. So the smart grid is one of the, the world's most complex machines in the world, it's, very, it's, it's a real-time machine where you've got electricity flowing dynamically all the time. It does not stop, and if it turns off, it's a problem. The whole blockchain will go down. In this case, we're talking 100 years of evolution of, of a very, very sophisticated system, and you've got literally hundreds, if not thousands, of standards and different things connecting to the electric grid, like solar panels and now electric vehicles, and you got microgrids and supergrids and all these different things. And this is to set the stage for kind of like what already is and where we kind of need to go and looking at how long this has taken to evolve and going back to things like the internet. 
So some of you guys have heard of fat protocols and thin protocols, not my idea. There's some people in this space that have kind of been talking about this, where the, the basic notion is the, the internet, uh, to me, I don't agree with it, but the internet was built on these thin protocols like TCP IP and HTTP, and then the application layers were the fat layers where all the value was transferred. So things like Twitter and Google and Facebook. But in reality, in 35 years ago is when TCP IP was invented with ARPANET. So this is 1983. It took that long for these protocols to get to the point where we could have things like Google and Facebook. And so we're in the same boat with blockchain. You can't just have instantaneous gratification here. So the fat protocol layer, I love this, this particular thing because it's basically a picture of a railroad track. And the quote is, an apparently underutilized but beautiful fat protocol. Because, you know, the idea is once you have a railroad track that's standard, you can put any kind of, you can go anywhere in the world on a railway with the same, same uh, railway. So it's, it's a beautiful concept. We'll talk a little bit about that. But the, the current situation is I, there's a lot of really great companies, including people on the panel that are working on this, including Hans working on self-sovereign identity and Hyperledger, of course. And there's th these different approaches to doing light, kind of thin layer, lightweight application level integrations of things like chain to chain relays and looking at side chains and looking at cross, cross chain atomic swaps and doing things like, you know, moving into where we can do decentralized exchanges, which is really great work. I think it's really important. And I'm not picking any winners here. There's a lot of people working on this. Of course, you've got the, the, uh, Foundations, you've got things like Cosmos, but everybody's heard about in Polkadot. Uh, Hashgraph just announced that they're actually going to be able to run Ethereum Solidity contracts on top of Hashgraph, so it, that's an interesting kind of approach to interoperability. Um, and then you've got Smart Mesh that's doing things like doing off chain mesh networks and where there's no internet connection at all. So you've got all these different ecosystems moving around. And the sort of thoughts on a couple, just a couple more slides here, and we'll get into the, the interesting debate discussion, I guess. My thoughts on interoperability is that I think, personally, I think that it's a little bit too early to be talking about interoperability because we really don't have anything really working that well and solid yet to even be talking about interoperating yet. However, the kind of two, the multiple elephants in the room to me are the security of things and people getting into things like self-sovereign identity and, uh, and device identity. Uh, the scalability issue, you've seen a lot of people doing proof of work and now everybody's talking about Ethereum Casper and, and these different methods of doing proof of stake as we just, we just heard of proof of, uh, proof of X. Um, to reduce some of the scalability issues with if you've got huge amounts of energy and enough to charge a Tesla just to do one transaction, in the business that I came from, it doesn't work. You can't go to people and tell them that you're going to use that much energy just to do a single transaction to transfer data on the electric grid. So the bandwidth issues, the data storage issues are being resolved, but they're not necessarily fixed, and it's going to take a long time. The version control system is that who has the version? I mean, if you talk about sophisticated enterprises that have full-time 24-7 IT people, you can see that they can maybe keep track of this, but the average person, I just bought another Ledger, Ledger Nano S, and as soon as I plugged it in, it had to go and I had to integrate and get a new piece of firmware, but then I had to make all these decisions about which version of Ethereum it was, which version of Bitcoin. It, over time, as you get more and more of these protocols coming in before things are even working, how do you keep track of this stuff? So there's all kinds of issues around that. The code itself, is it trusted? I mean, do you actually, Someone programmed this code, so you're assuming, um, you know, there's, there's been, I won't mention names, but there's been particular blockchains that have looked at trying to roll their own crypto. And we've seen kind of the, the repercussions of that. You don't really know what, if you're trusting something that's written in the code, you're assuming that it's, it's going to work perfectly, and we don't really know that yet. So again, the governance issue has been really important. Standards, we don't, even talk, we don't even have any standards. I mean, we're talking about all these independent companies that are talking about we're on the fourth, fourth generation of blockchain. I don't know what they're talking about. I mean, I don't think we, we're on fourth generation yet. It's only been three years since Ethereum after Bitcoin. Um, and then the interoperability issue, I think, is really important. It's really relevant. It's going to happen. 
But we just have to keep in mind, be humble, the fact that this is going to take some time. So what we're working on, uh, excuse me, I guess I'm going to trigger happy here. I will close with, we're working at the central, we're working on kind of a fat protocol because we fundamentally, the, uh, the underlying layer of end devices, I'm not talking about when you're talking about chain to chain or when you have a transaction on the blockchain. I'm saying what about the actual computing devices in the internet of everything where things are connecting to people and machines, autonomous things like robots coming online. There's something like the order of 200 billion plus sensor-enabled objects that are going to be connected to the internet. So those have to be secure themselves before we even talk about the endpoints. So we're, we're working on 10 layers of some of its patented, really sophisticated technology to make that endpoint as secure as possible. And then when the points actually communicate back and forth between each other on the transport, we're looking at securing that. On top of that, then you could sit microtransactions and do transfer of value. So we're, we're going to be integrating with, with Hyperledger, with Hashgraph, with other advanced technologies to actually make the machine economy happen. So that's kind of my, my take on it, but that sets the stage for um, this discussion, and uh, hopefully we'll have some really good questions from Hans. Thank okay. you. I'll try my best. I think uh, some really good points there. Um, I think we kind of like need to like go back to what interoperability is, and I think the important more part of that is operability. And this technology is, as, as we've already noted, this technology is not mature yet. So it's not, the scalability is still not there yet. So what is key to operability is scalability. That's a really important issue. Um, the other question, this will lead, lead into my question is, um, you know, we're talking about interoperability between what? Um, different blockchains, um, public and private blockchains, blockchains and traditional systems. Um, so we need to assess that, those three issues. And also, whether interoperability is desirable. Is it desirable from what, whose perspective? From the user perspective, from the enterprise perspective, who wants interoperability? Remember, who wants decentralization? What is decentralization, decentralization a goal or distribution a goal? So first off, I'd like Marta to, uh, to sort of address those issues. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think this is a really good point. First of all, what is interoperability? Um, is it um, exchanging information between ledgers? Um, because uh, today we are constantly, uh, from an enterprise point of view, uh, living uh, quite often in the world where enterprises are trying to say, well, I'll implement my stuff on a ledger, and then some other enterprise will uh, implement their stuff on a ledger, and then we need an uh, API that communicates between the ledgers, right? And we need interoperability. Well, that's not a blockchain solution. We need to get comfortable with uh, a solution where we are all on one ledger uh, for a certain use case, and then we don't need that interoperability. I think that um, we still kind of live in a world where we are thinking decentralized database rather than dis distributed ledger. Um, and this is a, b a big problem when it comes to enterprises. Of course, we won't have one ledger to rule them all. There are different ledgers um, uh, for different use cases. But there is a difference between decentralized database and the distributed ledger. Okay. okay. Francis, I mean, you're approaching if buckets uh, is, is solving the issue of coins at a POS level, right? So how does that look to you? How would you, how would you answer that? Um, I think I would probably take a step back. Um, mine would be more from a historical observation standpoint. And I would say that um, there's a couple of assumptions that I'm making here. And the critical assumption is that there's a wildly sophisticated and complex fabric that um, encompasses pretty much everything David put together. Um, so I'm assuming all of that is achievable, right? Um, and I, what I think interoperability 
means is context, right? So right now, you know, the easiest example we have are markets, right? And there's some weird uh, fanatical belief that markets are actually efficient, mathematically, empirically, um, quite the opposite, right? So you and I may come to a great deal on a, on a bargain for a car, but neither of us ever price in pollution, congestion, the fact that every car added to the road uh, increases oil and gas and everything like that. And that's because most of these mechanisms are inward focused and run by um, self-interest and, and people and they don't have the context, Ford doesn't have context into all of the things that all of their competitors are doing around the world. So if we're trying to solve the tragedy of the commons and stay on this planet that you know we have breathable air and drinkable water on, um, for all of these tokens, uh, chains, to have context as to what each other are doing uh, is really the only path forward for us to build efficient systems. Uh, and there's water dripping behind you. Okay. Um, <laughs> so context for you is very important. And I think that's interesting because uh, I, I was thinking also industry verticals. Um, so you might want to have a, a ledger for an industry, particularly in this industry vertical. And a lot of people, so that's where consortiums come in, where consortiums form, create an um, industry vertical. But whether that is necessary to have interoperability between that chain and other chains is, is the question. I think that uh, we need uh, modularity between chains, right? So more than APIs between chains, we want the chains to be uh, modular so that we can maybe exchange con consensus mechanisms that what we are trying to do within Hyperledger, right? We have five different frameworks now uh, that are different. They are not competitive in any way. They are uh, compatible in many ways and uh, Hyperledger Fabric and Hyperledger Sawtooth are the two staple examples where people get confused why do we have two very similar frameworks. Well, they are not similar. They are different in many ways. Uh, but they have different consensus mechanisms and we have also Hyperledger Borrow that you, you mentioned. Uh, and they have, uh, now you can run Solidity smart contracts on both Hyperledger Sawtooth and Hyperledger uh, Borrow because we believe that that consensus mechanism can be plugged into different, uh, different frameworks. Because the consensus is what, what it really matters. Okay. Um, so I'll give you a sort of case study. It's quite good because it's a bit of a plug. It's just block pass. Um, block pass, we're Ethereum right now. We want to be blockchain agnostics. We want to do a NEO. We want to do Hyperledger. We're a, these, uh, basically an uh, identity verification platform that uses a um, protocol called DID, which is W3C. So. In that sense, it could be at the DAP level, DAP layer, with smart contracts that can, different smart contracts can work on different ledgers, right? With RSK, uh, Solidity can work on Bitcoin. So, David, so is it possible to bu build interoperability through the DAP level of the stack um, between, between applications in this sense? It's a, it's a good question. Um, the, what I was thinking about is that I go back to that kind of the, if you have a really good use case for interoperability, like the, the railway, or if you look at like um, solar, all solar um, inverters in the world work on like a, a, an IEEE standard where if it's going to connect to the grid, they all have to use the same standard universally. And that's a great app, but it's, it's really, almost, it's got a vertical in a certain area. So th the idea of having different industries like financial industry, and now you're getting into the Internet of Things and all these different things. I think there's going to be some segregation and some verticalization of that no matter what you do. But if you look at like what you're working on, the, the, the identity, where you're talking about people, that's kind of more of a horizontal. You could see that, that that's a protocol that you, could, you want for everybody because no matter what, you're still, you still want to have an identity as a person. And so I think that's easier to make that kind of leap, whereas if you get into, say, medical devices versus, say, smart grid devices, it's very hard to think that those industries are going are to collaborate. And you know, even like the, as the example of the smart grid, the, a lot of those protocols are never going to talk to each other, right. just, just based on the security issues. So you could have identity protocol for devices, but it'd be verticalized. 
yeah. right, more That's where human identity or maybe enterprise identity could like be ported across like Hyperledger, Fabric, in, in cases of shipping and maybe in foreign insurance industry at the same time because you might be insured, an enterprise might be insured to ship something, right? Yeah, I guess so supply chains get yeah. interesting because yeah. you've, got, you've, got, you've got things, products tra traversing all these different geographies and all these different places, and so you're just going in and out of these different industries, and that's where I think there might be some more interoperability potential. I think, yeah, and I think there, there comes a certain level of governance as well, right? Uh, a need for a certain level of governance. And uh, I, I'm a bit, uh, well, cautious that there, uh, for, for, a real govern uh, for a real interoperability, there is a need for g governance. Um, I don't think that we can achieve a pure interoperability without governance, uh, or I wonder, I mean, maybe maybe I don't have the real imagination how to achieve uh, interoperability without governance. Without <laughs> human governance. H human governance. Or AI governance. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Interoperable humans, yeah. yeah. So, Francis, what, what do you think? Um, I absolutely agree with both of them. I think, um, again, from a historical context perspective, um, you know, I'll I'm picking on the financial markets. I sort of feel like that's always the entry point for all of this and sort of the most relatable. Um, but to your point about governance, uh, the fact that most of the people building these projects do not understand the critical historical decisions made um, that led to a financialized world where Bitcoin was born from. Um, lessons like Bretton Woods, lessons like Glass-Steagall, uh, understanding the implications of deregulating derivatives. These are all um, really important lessons that we need to draw from uh, and embed into governance levels. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I, I think that we all fall back into always um, tokens and uh, real assets. And for th even that reason, we, we think in, in some kind, we, we fall back into uh, some kind of a trusted third party. Right. And um, there is a difference between decentralization and distribution. Uh, and of course, uh, we may aim for decentralization, but uh, today we, we know how to do distribution. Right, and I guess there's no absolute. I mean, if you look at Bitcoin itself, there is a governance. There's, there's the Bitcoin core group, right? There's a certain amount of government, governance there. And what level of governance you want to call that, it's up to you. But um, so with governance, it sort of under, undermines the idea of decentralization. That's what we're pointing out. So um, how do you see um, all these different projects? We, you, I mean, you mentioned all of them, right? Polkadot, um, there's uh, Cosmos, which is Tendermint based. Um, we have three or four different uh, state channel off chain um, that people say that will lead to interoperability. Do you believe this, um, David? Do you think, <laughs> what, what do you think of the state channels? They're just set, the idea is that they'll be able to send like Lightning 2.0 is that you can send from Bitcoin to Ethereum and back to Bitcoin. You can send tokens. Is that? I mean, I believe that, you know, it's the wild, wild west. So I think that there's a lot of creativity and a lot of people trying to solve the problems and that, you know, there is going to be a lot of compartmentalization, I believe. But I think what needs to change is that as I was reading through, I'm really, I don't pretend to be an expert on interoperability in blockchains. I've been working with various types of blockchain technologies and so I think I kind of understand what's going on. But I think some of the claims that people are making when they're saying that they have, they're going to be the next internet of blockchains or the blockchain of blockchains. And so everybody's saying the same thing. It's not, I think what, I, I hate to say it, but I go back to, you know, kind of like, sound like a broken record, but if you get into the standards bodies, the standards are not unlikely to be developed by an individual small company. You know, you've got very, very large entities that build standards like the International Electric Tech, uh, IEC, you've got IEEE, you've got National Institute of Standards. These are the people that really have to come in and help the industry decide how we're going to create this, these layers of interoperability because I think that the companies that are all claiming, you have, you have a thousand companies claiming they're the next internet of blockchains, that's not believable to me. 
I think that we are still in a phase of experimentation and it's very early days, as you said, and um, we need to understand what are the consequences and what, what are we really trying to achieve. And uh, it is a bit too early to create any kind of standards. Uh, we can uh, create best practices. Uh, we can see what, uh, what will bring to the industry. And from only that, we can then put our heads together and say, okay, this is what works, this is what ha hasn't been really working very well, and bring that to the standardization bodies. But mm -hmm. that can be created together as, you know, kind of crowdsourced uh, version. Well, what we are trying to do in Hyperledger is bring kind of, the, for the sort of open source, bring the community together and say, okay, this is, seems kind of to be working. Uh, we've put together, you know, couple of thousand uh, developers together and let's let's see if it works and it's it's exciting that way but we can't say okay well let's sit down three people together write a standard and now everyone obey to it it, it, it doesn't work that way yes yeah good point I think that's really important point and particularly coming from you Marta because you're kind of on the front line being the head of an ecosystem where there's what six different code bases uh, uh, yeah, five frameworks, five tools. Five, yeah. Six, five codes, okay. Yeah. So we're talking about uh, le uh, Hyperledger uh, Fabric, fabric Sawtooth, 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 Borrow, um, uh, Quorum. Uh, uh, sorry? Quorum is part of uh, Quorum is R3, which is a yeah. member, but it's yeah. not part of yeah. uh, Hyperledger uh, code base. Okay. Uh, but there is uh, Quilt, which is the inter mm -hmm. interoperability yeah. project that uh, came to us. Uh, it is the interledger protocol okay. implemented in Java. Right. So we have both tools and uh, and frameworks that are more on the, uh, on the um, kind of um, uh, protocol level side of things, yeah. Okay. Uh, I kind of agree with, I mean, I kind of take back what I said a little bit because this idea that the standards bodies are not going to come in and solve the problem. The industry has to kind of show them what the p potential is, but I think that's where you have to start working with these bodies. And so I think I appreciate all the open source work that's been done in the past. It's really a lot of what's created most of the standards. So I think that um, that's a really good thing. But David, how does that, I mean, we look at, I mean, we look at Bitcoin, and we look at Ethereum, and they have a core group of developers. They're the ones that actually put together what the next flavor is going to be, the next version of Bitcoin or the next version of Ethereum. How does that work with this, this whole idea? Can that type of model work in a, I mean, that was a, started out small, and then it became Bitcoin sort of proven in a way. Um, I mean, I guess, you know, there's been a lot of um, good technologies that have been built by small teams. I think the, you know, focused teams building things, and if it's done really well, it could work, yeah. Um, the, the governance issue comes back into play. It's like, you know, who's going to decide if you start changing all the different forks of the different technologies, and then you've got, now you've got situations where people are coming in and they have open source technologies and you got other people wanting to patent the technologies because they don't want people forking them before everything blows up. You know, so there's, a, there's an art form of, of getting it to work really, really well. And I think that's what needs to happen is that you just need to mash up all these technologies and, and really find the ones that are working the best. In fact, I was, I was actually speaking at the National Institute of Standards on this technology uh, about cybersecurity and they all looked at me and said we don't we have like we have a blueprint we have this idea of what we want but if you actually come up with something that is really really valuable we will actually help you standardize it so i think that really the takeaway is i think that we shouldn't be alienate we shouldn't be thinking that we can do it on our own i think we need to move to another especially when you talk about this interoperability thing so do you think um I mean, there's Hyperledger Foundation, but there's other foundations like in the identity space and the I IoT space. There's, I there's a De Decentralized Identity Foundation, mm -hmm. which is sort of creating identity. They're based on DID, which is W3C. And then there's a Trusted IoT Alliance, yep. which is looking at building smart contracts for standards for devices. Do you think this is all good, good things? These are nation sort of new new foundations? Well, the Trusted IoT Alliance, I was actually at one of the founding meetings there. I mean, that's, that's Cisco. That's a pretty large company. So um, I think they're on the right track. It's just a slow-moving slow train. But it's definitely in the right track. I haven't 
been involved in the Decentralized Identity Foundation, but it sounds like that's in the, going in the right direction as well. I, I think that uh, one of the, uh, particularly in the identity uh, space, one of the amazing things is that there is a lot of uh, collaboration there. Um, I think that identity is, we kind of understand that there can't be many identity solutions out there. So, um, Linux Foundation and Hyperledger is part of, I think, almost all of the ident uh, but we are kind of uh, 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 associate members of each other. So, uh, Diff is I associate member of uh, Hyperledger. We are associates of uh, Diff, and we are working closely with DID and ID2020 and so on and so forth. And we are really trying to, and Indy uh, is our identity project, part of Sovereign Foundation. So, we are trying really to figure out that space together because it, it is the future, right? We need kind of, we, blockchain or not blockchain, we need to figure out identity of the future for humans and non-humans. Yeah, it's absolutely essential for inclusion and, and, and getting to the unbanked in the world, absolutely. Yeah. So Francis, you, would you like to add yeah, anything to I, that? I would just add that, you know, I think much like the internet um, was never ever adequate at any given point in time, uh, was driven to scale and evolve um, through tangible problems, needs, demand. Um, I think this space, even though it's sort of on a uh, super exponential speed because it's built on uh, the fact that we have a lot of ubiquitous global connection, um, but also all of these things I think um, I agree with Marta, we're in the experimental phase right now, but there hasn't been clear, you know, things that have reared their heads that have demanded the entire space to, to really focus in and, and build it. Um, I think it'll happen over time. Okay. Um, Andrew, do you think we can ask some questions? We're, we're running a little short on time. Okay. We're going to okay. encourage people to, like, get you at the party after a couple of okay. drinks. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Then we'll be